Welcome to the Social Media Church Podcast. My name is Aaron, and I am joined today by my co-host, Nils Smith. Uh, usually when I kick it off, uh, Nils is not here, so we, we're, we're faking you guys out today. Um, and you're in for a treat. You've probably already noticed this by the title, uh, but we have an incredible guest on the podcast today. And this podcast has started all the way back in 2013 with the goal of connecting you as a listening audience with the very best top tier people that lead the space for churches in all sorts of different realms. And today we actually get to interview a CEO uh, and we're so excited about that. And so I'm going to kick it over to Nils because uh, Nils has a longer standing relationship with this wonderful individual uh, and is going to do a way better job of honoring this person before we hop into the podcast. So Nils, do you want to, you want to set up our audience with uh, today's guest? Yeah, I'm so fired up about uh, this this conversation, um, and I'll give some backstory of my my relationship to Push Bay. Um, and so, so today we're going to be interviewing uh, and having a conversation with Molly Matthews, the CEO of Push Pay. But my my connection to Push Pay uh, goes back many many years. Uh, as as I've gotten to watch uh, this company uh, be birthed, much like I've gotten to watch a lot of church plants uh, be birthed, and and just like Shoreline City, I feel like even the the agent stage of Shoreline City is very similar to uh, to Push Pay that that I've you know gotten to watch grow and develop. But you know, Push Pay uh, came in, into my uh, world as I got to know uh, the the founders uh, early on with Chris Heaslip uh, and Elliot Crowther as they really, and I remember meeting Elliot and him just sharing his heart to, we want to bring the best in technology to the church. And, and him even saying like, think about how easy it is for people to buy a product on Amazon, people should be able to donate to churches that easily. And church leaders don't need to be so focused on technology. They need to be focused on ministry. We need to make it easier for them. And I watched him do what he said he was going to do. Uh, and 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 I've gotten to watch Pushpay as a company really step into the church and serve the church well. And my heartbeat through the years has always been, or I say my heartbeat, my pain point has often been that the church has gotten afterthoughts uh, in the area of technology. And so while we don't have companies and CEOs on this podcast often, because we're focused on ministry, I think this is such an important conversation today. Uh, and it came out of a research study that Pushpay just did. And so if you're not familiar with Pushpay, uh, they, they serve the church through technology, uh, with online giving, with mobile apps, with live streaming. Uh, but they did a recent, uh, and, and we'll dig into to the, the, the research, uh, but they yeah. did a recent research study uh, about churches or with churches and with mm -hmm. Catholic churches as well, which is really interesting, really identifying the state of technology. And I was shocked uh, in a good way, uh, but, but I think a lot of the things that I learned. Um, so I'm excited to dig into it. Uh, so I, I want to introduce Molly Matthews. Molly, thank you so much uh, for joining us and having this conversation today. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here and reconnect after, you know, a couple years of, of COVID, unfortunately, kind of not allowing people to get together. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that is such a, a vivid memory of mine is when we in the past had all been able to be together at different church conferences and just in service of the church together, whether we're, you know, pressing into social media and communications or we're mm -hmm. leading from the technology front like we are at Pushpay. Yes. Totally. So I my one of my favorite memories of being in person is Pushpay's uh, first two conferences, at least the ones I remember at Disneyland. Uh, and and it was they were the two You just can't two, go wrong with Disneyland, uh -uh. right? You, you like, cannot go wrong with Disneyland. Place. <laughs> and John Maxwell was speaking at the first one yes. uh, and Seth Gordon, I believe, at the second one. Yes. Uh, and I got to meet both those guys at those conferences and just but but I would say it was the happiest place in the world. And it was the most just the the, the presentations uh, that were brought. Yes. Uh, and I'm obviously drawn to some of those unique leaders in, in Maxwell and Godin. But I, I remember the breakouts and uh, it just was they, they were they're special, you know, moments. And I and I have the privilege of being at and speaking at a lot of conferences, but it definitely, my kids, my kids are still upset. They're like, when are we going back to Disneyland? Uh, we miss those Disney con they were, conferences. They were trying yeah. to figure out why dad wasn't working for push pay anymore I, yeah. Yeah, uh, I was uh, after that. And I think my girls didn't get to come. And so I heard about yeah. that for years. Yeah. Right. But you know, I think that the thing I loved about those experiences also, and this is truly the heartbeat of push pay is we've mm -hmm. always wanted to bring best in class tech and business leaders to the church, right? Yeah. Like why should we as, as believers not be equipped 
with yeah. best in class tech or leadership. Yeah. I um, I loved those sessions too. I remember, you know, obviously I wore a different hat for push pay at that time, but just sitting in the audience and hearing from Seth Godin, yeah. who really yeah. has no connection to the church space, but has every tool in his toolkit to give to the church to yeah. help them to expand their ministry and and really to evangelize. And I just thought like it was one of those moments, like a historical moment in my career where I really saw business completely collide with ministry yeah. in such a real way. And it was just, it was awesome too, to just sit and hear the banter between people, the, the folks that were writing in their notebooks of thinking about how do we reach more people with mm -hmm. these great marketing tools yes. and tips that he was giving that, that crowd that day. It was amazing. That's yeah. awesome. Molly, I'm curious hearing about you wearing a different hat then. Maybe just walk our audience before we dive into the numbers, before we dive into kind of the sure. meat of this. Uh, do you want to let us know your push pay journey? Maybe even just your journey to push pay as well. Just give us a little uh, three or four minute background on yourself. Sure. Well, I um, have had anything but a straight path to the role that I sit in today. Uh, one that I'm exceptionally grateful for. I think you know, for people who are, are listening, who are in ministry, I think many people have this same story, which is, you know, I, I maybe didn't go to seminary or I didn't go to business school or I didn't, you know, graduate thinking this is the place that I want to get to in my career. Um, but I have had just an immense amount of wonderful people invest in me throughout my career and help me to see some things that maybe I didn't even see in myself, which I think is is really, I think, the story of my career journey. I started out, I went to University of Oregon. Erin, I know you're an Oregonian. We went to opposing schools, but- um, I forgive you. We're, pa <laughs> we're kind of past super, it. We're kind of past it. Yeah. Super, super um, thankful for that experience to get to know people. I was able to, I grew up as an athlete and that was kind of what I was known for in my small community, right? Was being on every team and, and kind of that was my identity. And so when I, I moved and shifted into college, I had the opportunity to sort of expand my worldview for the first time. I grew up in a tiny town, um, one stoplight, graduated with 55 other kids who probably three quarters of whom I went to kindergarten with, right? Small town. Can you name and the town, Molly? Because I'm from sure. Oregon. This, this, we'll, okay. just, we'll just rep Oregon here for a second. Yes, we should. The, the other 10 people that might be from there. Yeah. Um, I grew up in Sheridan, Oregon. Yes. So Sheridan, if you're driving from Portland to the beach to Lincoln City, it's, yep. it's the Dairy Queen. That's what it's known for, nice. right on the highway that you We're known for the Burgerville. Albany's known there for the Burgerville yes. off the I-5. Yep. Yes, I, know. I love it. I, Shout out to small town Oregon. This is so right. good. Small towns in Oregon. I love it. Um, so when I when I got to university, it just was such an opportunity for me to kind of think bigger and think outside of my, my kind of worldview and uh, kind of launched from there into social work. I was, no one will be shocked by this, this like wildly ambitious, you know, 22 year old. And one of my professors actually really challenged me to, to think about, I had always wanted to do international missions. That was, that was where my heart was. I had uh, done a, a tour in Guatemala. I'd been able to go and spend quite a bit of time in the Dominican Republic with a wonderful organization called Students International that's still thriving today in those communities. And my professor was a Native American gentleman, and he he just really challenged me to say, have you looked at home first, mm. right? There are many problems. There are many societal issues here that need to be dealt with. And he was such a visionary, like a futurist, you know, and I didn't even know what that meant at that time. But, you know, he really challenged me to think local before I thought international mm. and what impact could I make? I happen to grow up in Sheridan, I'm just outside of a really beautiful Native American community and had many friends and family members who are part of that community. And so kind of went and started to explore and just understand what that, that community was battling with, what their youth were battling with, what the pain points of their, their culture was. 
and uh, had the opportunity to partner with their community and some amazing people to build a build out a really exceptional youth program there. And so that's kind of how I started. And I'm not native. And so there came a point I had my two uh, babies and and really felt like that needed to be handed off to someone who was native somebody mm-hmm. who was going to be planted there, raise their children there, and really ha- think about it as a legacy, a- mm-hmm. as opposed to people kind of moving in and out, which is is not what that community needed. And so mm-hmm. left from there, uh, started a, a very small team of one consulting business uh, for many years, loved that, had the ability to grow and expand myself in, in business, started with mm-hmm. nonprofit and spread into small business and then into bigger technology businesses and really found a passion uh, for growth and technology and change management, which led me to uh, meet with the two co-founders of PushPay. If anybody had the opportunity to meet those guys, so dynamic, uh, full of energy. Elliot uh, was a friend of a friend. So my our family's best friend is was, you know, his good friend and met with him and and literally two weeks later, I was here working here. I'm like, I don't know how that went from a consulting pitch yeah. to a full-time job. Yeah. Um, but super grateful. Elliot and Chris are still good friends today and just had such a unique vision and approach to bringing tech to the church. Mm-hmm. And I just knew that that was an opportunity for me to, to really put my passion for mm-hmm. growing church community and my skills and talents and business together and make a huge impact. Wow. I love it. I love it. And Molly, what, what would you, for, for anyone, and most people listen to this podcast is going to, are going to know who PushPay is, but for somebody that might not, how would you describe what PushPay is? Cause it's so much more than I think yes. I would have always described. It's a giving platform, but it's yeah. now so much more than that. How, how, how do you describe PushPay today? Yeah, it certainly is. And it's just evolved so much uh, really over the last couple of years. So we we were rooted and founded in, in New Zealand, in Auckland, New Zealand. And it really was launched, Nils, as a generosity platform. So as a way to make giving to your local church as easy as it was to buy a song on iTunes. And so that was wow. the foundation of PushPay. And since then, we have evolved to be truly an engagement software where we touch communication, we touch generosity, we touch people management, child check-in. And now we've just recently acquired a a new piece, which is Resi Media. So we have live streaming and video content that that we also have. So I would say, you know, we are really uh, truly an ecosystem for the church Mm -hmm. to be able to, to run their organization with excellence. Wow, I love that. That's the the that. growth and the, and the and the adaptation, uh, all of those things. Really quick, how how did you? What was your progression specifically within PushPay? And then and then sure. we'll kind of start getting into the into the research and all the fun stuff. But I'm, I I yeah. think it's worth noting uh, strong female leadership, and that's something that we kind of had a, a conversation about prior to hopping on this call. Uh, and we know Molly that you're passionate about that, and it's just uh, I think it would be a miss. Uh, for us to not at the top of this podcast, just acknowledge uh, a female CEO who is absolutely crushing it and making a massive difference for the future of ministry in 2022. Well, thank you, Erin. I appreciate that. You know, I I think that I love talking about my journey at PushPay because I think that it it really has been one of servant leadership. Mm -hmm. You know, when I came in, it was such an all hands on deck moment. Everybody was doing everything in the best of ways. And I loved that. I love, I think, you know, if I break down what I'm really good at, it's fixing the broken, right? You can, you can use all the business terminology that you want, but the reality is, is I love when things are not going well, because that's when I really feel like I can lean in and add value. And so we, um, at that time when I joined, I joined in 2016 And we were not a startup anymore. We had kind of grown out of that phase transparently. And we had a lot of people and we were starting to win bigger churches, like big name churches that had a lot of people. And I remember Elliot and I getting together and he had just started to pitch some of these big churches. And he's like, but what happens after? 
like what happens after they buy. And so that was really the first uh, piece of the business that I leaned into was how do we onboard these larger organizations with excellence, with care? It's, it's vital that we do this well because it's their reputation on the line, right? It's, it's, yes, it's push pay, but when you talk about transitioning a donor management platform, it is a relationship that is extremely special between a donor and their church. And so we know that, and we always uh, really walked into those situations, understanding the importance and the value that we needed to bring. So started out uh, kind of designing, working with an incredible team that was already here to really build out what implementation looked like. That then evolved into, okay, great. When somebody's up and running, how do we grow that customer? How do we make sure that they're meeting their ministry goals and that that helps us as a business. And so we uh, started kind of a new area of push pay that's called customer success management and account management. And that really, again, is kind of a fancy way to say, we want to have an advocate employed by push pay that sits alongside of our customers and they advocate for their needs with our product team. They bring new solutions to them. They help guide them on how to best use our technology. And so that that was kind of the next piece. I, you know, kind of through the years took on different parts of, of the business and, and kind of had a hand in a lot of things, have had different hats. Uh, again, so grateful for that. I think stepping into this role, having a deep understanding of many different business functions, it's much like, you know, in the church, if you are leading a church, you likely have been a volunteer, you've helped park cars, you've been in kids ministry, you've, you know, collected and, and marked off the offering, you've done all those things. And I think it really helps you to have a deep appreciation for each person that works for you and your customers. Molly, I'd, I'd love to jump into out of that research, the research study. Um, sure. And so what, uh, you know, and, and really you dug into research uh, churches and Catholic churches uh, as well uh, in, in America, uh, if, if I remember right, uh, in the document or maybe North America. What, what, was your, what was the approach of the research before you commissioned it? And what, what did you expect uh, to, to see coming out of it? Or did you have expectations? Yeah, you know, I think that we had a couple of hopes out of, of walking through this research project. One is, and this is foundational to push pay. So one of our core values is generosity. And so we constantly think about what can we give from an information standpoint, from a resourcing standpoint, what can we give back? What can we give to churches? So mm -hmm. one of the whys behind that was how can we collect information so that we can pass it on for free to churches, to other community members, so they can kind of see where they stand amongst their peers. Yep. You know, it, it it's true in all kind of industries. You want to know, like, how, how are we doing compared to somebody down the road, right? And so that was one of the reasons we wanted to do that. The second was we had some thoughts about the future that we wanted to validate, right? So we want to be futurists at PushPay. We want to be here in 20 and 30 and 40 years to serve the church. And to do that, we know we have to always be attempting to walk two steps ahead. And so we kind of tested and validated some of our thoughts through that survey as well. That's awesome. And did you have expectations on what you were going to find? Yeah, you know, I think that we were curious, as, as you know, we just acquired a, a live streaming platform, Resi Media, mm -hmm. fantastic group, massive heart for the church. It's been so incredibly fun and fruitful to get to know that crew and, and yep. begin to dream about how we can integrate that into our platform as well. And so we wanted to, we wanted to learn a little bit about live streaming. You know, how, how are people viewing that? Was that just a a kind of peak that we saw through the the kind of pandemic season, or is this something right. that's here to stay? And so that was one of the statistics that I thought was super interesting, which is 91% of churches are currently live streaming at least some of their services. And 94% of churches believe that live streaming is going to be a part of their future. And so that was a, a, a huge moment. So I would just say, you know, to people who are listening, who are live streaming, you know, it's something to, that we wanted people to kind of think about, you know, am I viewing this as a critical mission, critical part yep. of my ministry, 
Or is this just something that we kind of do on the side because it was a need through the pandemic? Because I think what the research is saying is, and this is validated through the resi data of how many people are watching and streaming, is you know this is going to be a core part of ministry well into the future. And, and not that it replaces the that yep. just intensely rich connection of in-person, but it, it should be able to complement it, it was it was one of the things that that uh, about in the pandemic that seeing how churches so rapidly embrace live streaming in particular and online giving that I felt like churches were actually ready for the pandemic more than most even realized. Yes. Um, and, and that was uh, now some weren't. And, and I think it's unfortunate um, for, for those. But but I think many were. And, and I think, too, it's been fascinating. And I, and I think this is where I, you know, uh, have such a deep love for for what Pushpay has done is is the church is now empowered to embrace technology and I think even in the marketplace churches are no longer looked at as laggards uh, in technology now certain times we're slow to adopt uh, as church leaders uh, but but we are really pushing some limits of technology as you're now seeing a lot of churches even going into the metaverse and doing metaverse lit campuses yes, yes but I know. It's not- what stood out to me, Molly, in the research was the same statistics around live streaming. I was shocked to hear that 90%, over 90% of churches are live streaming. Also excited to hear that pretty much that same number are planning to continue to live stream. Mm-hmm. Um, that that some I felt like probably got into live streaming out of necessity, uh, but yeah. they're seeing the value of that opportunity. Um, and I love too how you're describing Pushpet as an engagement, as engagement software, uh, because our goal, goal in technology is not to disengage people from right. church, but to help them stay engaged. What uh, I'm curious, maybe outside of the streaming side, or maybe mm-hmm. even as we look at both, you did research on the Catholic side uh, and the you know Protestant church side. What, what were some of the differences that you noticed, or maybe what are some things that stood out outside of the streaming? Sure. So one of the other things that was a little hard to read, but just it's the reality, the data is the data, which is about the importance of security to a church, right? That was very high. But then when we asked people to stack rank how and why they make a purchase, that number really fell. So that was interesting to me. And again, you know, if I put my push pay cap on, I think to myself, how can we help to educate the church market on yep. on how to bring together the buying decision and the importance of security. And so that yes. was one I think that our whole team left as a massive aha moment. Um, and you know you see you see differences in kind of the different sizes of church and and to be really honest, I think people have a perception that security is really expensive mm-hmm. and that is not true. And so I think that is one of the myths that needs to be broken down. And I, I also have seen in a good way, you know, I, I love to get into the weeds. I join sales conversations all of the time. I join with customers all of the time. And I am seeing, and I think this is one of the incredible things that, you know, things like your podcast are doing is they are bringing to light the options and the opportunities that church leaders have to be more informed and make better decisions for their community. And so I am seeing people make, you know, at at least add it, right? Add security into the list of things that they're going to check off. Yes. But as we see so many people transitioning to have at least a hybrid church experience, so part of it be a digital and part of it be in person, the need for us to think about security gets even more important. So, you know, a few moments ago, I was talking about how we realize and deeply recognize that the relationship around a donation or a gift is between that giver and their church. It's not push pay. Similarly, when security breaks down, nobody's looking at, at the vendor, right? They're like, my church just lost my information or they just, you know, sold my phone number or, you know, whatever it could be. And I think for the church today, it, it's it's just critical that they are thinking and talking about this and thinking about data privacy and partnering with vendors who have that top of mind and can prove it, right? Yes. It's one thing to check the box, but like they need to be asking really specific, thoughtful questions to ensure that whomever they partner with, not even in just in generosity or live streaming, but you know, for 
um, no. background checks for, for youth right. events, for anything they do, that the vendors that they're paying dollars to are living up to their commitment around security and privacy. That's so good, Molly. And for the and for the few people that haven't figured it out yet, we're not talking about uh, on-site children's security. We're not talking about on-site right. um, uh, security that might be manning your building during a physical church service. We are talking about data security online. Uh, yes. And yeah, it has been overlooked. And I know Nils has been leading this conversation and talking about this for a long time. I mean, even, I think it was two years ago at the Dunham Conference, you were talking about, hey, everybody, uh, data security is really important and we can't skimp on this. Um, Molly, you've, you've kind of alluded to a few things. What would be one practical step that a church could take right now uh, to kind of evaluate, oh, I never thought about, you know, we think about it for children. We have not thought about it for people's data. Uh, what would be a step somebody could take really quickly, uh, maybe right when they turn this podcast off to check, how is our church doing when it comes to data security? Yeah, I think that, I think that one of the things I hope for my company. So I would imagine my peers that serve the church with other tech would feel the same way mm -hmm. is we should be taking on that risk on the church's behalf. So the first thing that they should do is ask the vendors or the partners that they have in the space about their security protocols. Wow. Because I don't think that it's the church's responsibility to take on the, the cost or the risk associated with doing that. It's, it's the vendor's responsibility the church's responsibility is asking the question and getting the documentation or the proof point. So when I think about uh, donations, right, there, there are just a few basics. PCI compliance, which is, you know, kind of a banking term. But essentially, that's something that our company goes through to ensure that we are as secure with information around donation as a bank. So Wells Fargo, you know, all of those different banks have to be PCI level one compliant. So is PushPay. And, and other folks that are out there have, have different kind of uh, levels of compliance as well. So I would ask that question. The other thing when it comes to donation is there should not be a time when a church is holding information about a giver's bank accounts, credit card numbers, that is very, very risky. And so again, you want to partner with a vendor that takes that risk on for you. We use something, again, I'm going to use, you know, a kind of a, a nerdy uh, finance term, We're here for but it. it's tokenization, We're here for it. right? So we tokenize those details so that they cannot be leaked out. I don't even have them, right? We tokenize on receipt so that we are not putting that giver or that donor's information at risk ever. So churches should never be storing that information and they should always be asking their partners in this if they are tokenizing and that they're protecting data. I think when I think about um, the other sides of the house, so when I think about people data or church management systems, mm -hmm. you know, I actually had the opportunity to, to kind of live this out a couple of weeks ago. I volunteer um, in the nursery at our church sometimes nice. on Sunday evenings. Um, my kids are 13 and 10, so there's nothing better as a, as a mom than just rocking other kids' babies and then yes. just giving them back at the end of yeah. the service. It's, it's, be yep. it's a beautiful thing. I love that volunteer role. And I, uh, through my application on my phone, our pastor sent me a invitation to fill out, as he should, a background check, right? And mm -hmm. mine had expired. It needed to be refreshed. It was through Checker, which is an amazing background check partner that we have actually at PushPay. And so my church uses PushPay, Church Community Builder, and Resi. And I swear they don't do that just because I go there. But they um, went through a formal process and made that selection. But I got that invitation on my mobile phone. I was able to fill it out in a few seconds. I didn't even think twice about putting my social security number in yep. and just hitting send. And literally, I, I'm no exaggeration, like maybe 60 seconds and I had that filled out and sent off, you know, so it's, wow. it's really also about finding partnerships out there that are all inclusive so that mm -hmm. your volunteers and community members feel safe giving you the information that you need to run your ministry. That's, that's so good. That practical insight. If, if you're, uh, I would say any pastor, church leader, yep. any ministry leader who is going to be going through a process um, or even wherever you are, I would rewind about five minutes and re-listen to that and take yeah. really detailed notes about PCI compliance, 
about data tokenization or giving, you know, payment tokenization, yeah. 100%. Um, because those are really important details that you don't need to know the nuance of, but you, you don't, I think part of the pain, Molly, is that pastors don't don't think about technology and in many ways we don't right. want them to think too much about technology sure. we want them right. to focus on ministry but you've got to know enough to ask the right questions uh and what questions to ask and i think to to have those questions ready uh, I, w- I want to just give a couple of practical tips here as a nonprofit fundraiser um is when it comes to data that you need you need communication data of your people uh and so churches so often don't get the email addresses or don't prioritize the ability to be able to communicate with your people. But what you don't need that Molly was just saying is you don't need to have all their credit cards on file because that's a major liability. And and I think too, we often right. think in terms of liability to your point earlier, Aaron, of kids ministry and what happens because totally. we've seen those lawsuits. But yes. when data gets breached, we also hear about that on the news. We don't hear about that in as much yet about nonprofits and churches, but yet totally. is the key word uh, yeah, if we're totally. not smart. And then I would say to the one other practical piece of advice that I, I, you know, hound all the time is don't yes. share passwords. Stop sharing passwords. Oh. Yeah. Um, yes. and emailing passwords. We need to do a whole episode on that, Nils. Just an episode on should. the top five things. And oh my gosh. I agree. And I think the other thing about that password piece or sharing credentials, right? Yes. Again, right. I know that's, yeah, that's kind of what a, it is. a formal way to say that, but sharing any yes. type of credentials. Yes. The thing that is amazing that I hope the church takes advantage of or non-for-profits take advantage of is we now have access as consumers to these world-class tools at a really reasonable price point, yes. right? Yes. Okta, there's LastPass, there's Last all pass. of these different ways, because goodness yep. gracious, like I have a hundred different logins and passwords. There's no way I'm going to remember it. And yes. if I have to, you better believe it's going to be like the month, the day, the something of my, my when we got our dog, right? Like over and over <laughs> right. and over again. But yeah. with those tools that we all yep. can purchase now for a really reasonable cost, you really can kind of take away that risk. Totally. And I think as a leader, you you really have to mandate that because that is yes. um, such a great point. And it really is a risk that data can flow yes. out and you don't know who did it. Totally. Right. Like that's the other thing. And, and most of the time it's, it's not with a negative intent, oh, totally. but it's an accident. So you yep. really yep. need to be able to kind of go back and figure out where that, that leak happened. And a lot of the problem is not the one person that needs to keep logging in. It's this person also needs it. So let me share it in a screenshot. Let me share it via email. Oh, let's just create this shared Google doc. And for the, for the three people on this call, uh, you are crying inside deep, passionate tears when you hear that or see that. Uh, and so these solutions all, which is why we need to do an episode on this Nils, but these solutions actually solve the sharing piece. So it's not just the memory piece, but it's also the inner department sharing. And that is vital because again, we care about people digitally as well as people physically. Yep. Yes. And I'm going to say something and I don't mean to be controversial, but I, I think that it's important to think about this from a investment standpoint, right? We always want to talk about dollars, right? Spend, money, cost, price. I like to think about it as where am I investing in my own business, right? Where am I investing in my own church? Am I investing in the tools and the technology that are going to keep my people safe, thriving, and growing? Or am I going to invest more money in coffee, Mm. right, in a lobby? Like, I'm sorry, but I've seen some... P&Ls from churches and the (laughs) amount of dollars spent on things like that, but then they're not willing to spend the same amount of money on a tech tool as you do. Or less. Right. Or Or less. less. I mean, I, I just think in goodness, I am a Seattleite. I love coffee, but I, I just think sometimes we need to have that moment, that gut check moment where we say, am I genuinely going to invest more in this category than I am in security, than I am in software that protects my people. For us, we, you know, and I understand that I'm the the leader of PushPay, so I'm super passionate about this, but we here, we only invest in software that we believe is going to grow our business into the future. And I think churches have to do the same thing. Is this going to grow with me or am I going to outgrow it and have to switch? Because the cost of changing every couple of years is really expensive, right? So how can we really think about our decision making as an investment versus just another line item? 
That's so good. That is so good. I and I yeah that that is that is such a good point. Um, the coffee yeah. piece, man. I, I, we need to clip that if, if we have permission yeah. to clip that. I, it, it actually, the coffee it actually, companies are not going to like me. But. For the I, people I, in the back, they got to hear it. Yeah. What, what's man. funny at Community Bible Church? Uh, I remember when I joined the executive team, I got brought into to conversations that I was not used to, as I was just in communications and media. And two of them, one was coffee. Community Bible Church was at the time and probably still is the number one consumer of coffee in San Antonio, Texas. Uh, and we had the worst wow. like liquid based coffee. It was not Seattle <laughs> quality uh, coffee, um, but it was fascinating to hear how much money we we're spending on coffee. And then we had these two fish, fish tanks that cost us $8,000 a month. Uh, and you just, there's there are certain expenses, but, but it, it, it does. Uh, I, I think to, you know, Molly, your point of, of, of leaning into a technology that you can grow with, um, right. and, I, and, I, and I would say to the, the other side that technology that churches need to understand is to adapt uh, because these technologies are going to change and push pay has mm-hmm. changed. Um, mm-hmm. and, and I think you also want a partner who is going to keep changing the, the pain point that I saw. Um, and I really, you know, I don't want to call out a, a name of, um, of, of another company. Uh, but, but we would often say at community Bible church that we had one F word that was really not allowed uh, in, in our church. Um, and, and so it, uh, it just, but, but that platform had not changed in 10 years, yeah. you know, from when we were using it and, 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 and you have to keep changing, yes. which is why it's hard for a company like Pushpay because they have to keep working to keep up yeah. with the security trends, with the technology trends, with yep. Apple changes and, and things like that. Molly, I, I would love to know, uh, and this is where I really get giddy about technology is where do you see so much of this is going? So as you're now in yeah. live streaming, you're mobile apps, yeah. you're giving uh, an engagement. What, what, do you, where do, what do you see as you look ahead and kind of prepare technology for the future? Yeah. You know, I, I see, I know I used this word a little bit earlier, but it's something I actually, uh, one of my colleagues here at Pushpay sent me this amazing article this morning from the Harvard Business Review about how now CEOs no longer just asked to run a business, but they're asked to steward an ecosystem. And yeah. I, I think of what we're creating at Pushpay as an ecosystem. And so when I think about where we need to be futuristically, we have to be connecting all of the data points to tell a story of how we can move somebody from a one-time online attendee who had a Facebook post shared with them. And so they clicked through and they watched that incredible message and they wanted to take the next step and they had a digital path to do so. And that we at PushPay can connect that data story together and serve it to the church leadership team so that they can walk that community members journey forward. We, you know, we are not the people in ministry and we know that we are here to create the technology to give capacity to church leaders to do the ministry. And so that is something that we're um, just passionately pushing forward. We're doing that for our evangelical, Lutheran, Protestant churches. We're also doing that for the Catholic community. You know, we believe in the capital C church at Pushpay, and that includes our brothers and sisters that are Catholic. And so we want to make sure that we're also creating products that really can can um, help our Catholic community members to walk people forward in their spiritual journey as well. Um, but yeah, I think data, 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 data. The second one would be analytics, right? Data is great. I don't know if any of you have had this or if either of you have had this issue, but you get spreadsheets of information. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Now yeah. what? Right. You know, that, and that's the question that we ask our team all the time. Great. Now what? Yep. And they're like, Hmm, good question, right? What do you right. do with it? Mm-hmm. And, and if I think about the incredible ministry leaders that we're serving, they do not have time to sit and peel through spreadsheets and connect and make the pivot table to tell them, this is what I need to do because I know this information. So we need to do that. We need to curate and create a way for us to take all the great data that we have and and serve it to and visualize it for our ministry leaders so that they can be more effective in ministry. 
That's so good. Is there, I'm curious, uh, and we can spend, let's spend a little bit of time here because I, I don't think we have a very large Catholic uh, listening audience. If you are, Nils and I would love to know about that. You can uh, reach out to us on Twitter, basically anywhere, find, follow, find us in the show notes. Um, but do you maybe want to speak to some of the findings? Like, I, I think uh, maybe the perception could be that uh, from us Christians that the Catholic church might be behind in some of these areas. Is that actually true? What, what's something maybe even that we could learn from the Catholic church in just you starting this relationship, uh, in this kind of, we're all in this together mentality. Mm-hmm. Um, what are some of those things that you've discovered in these early stages of starting to walk alongside the Catholic church, which I think is really cool. Yeah. I think the thing that's really interesting is there weren't massive differences in the responses or the data that came out of the Protestant side or the Catholic side of the survey. That Mm -hmm. to me in itself was really interesting, right? I think I had assumed, which a person shouldn't do, but I did, that there would be some differences. And there, there were in some ways, but there weren't in others. So as an example, I think that there was a difference of, you know, from 88% on the live stream question to 92%. Like that is not a massive difference. I was expecting our Catholic parishes to say, hey, we're not live streaming, right? Or we're not thinking about that. The reality is, is they might not be doing it, but they're definitely thinking about it. And I think, you know, one of the things that's been really amazing about the last 18 months as we've kind of dove in, we are learners at PushPay as well. Mm That's teachable is also one of our core values. Like we want to learn from our prospective customers before we build something so that we're building something that's meeting their needs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they're thinking about all the same things. They might have different language, right? They may um, have a different structure, but at the heart of their church is the same as the heart of the Protestant church, which is to help people to have a deeper relationship with Jesus. And so that is really essentially what we're trying to do for them as well but just wrap the right language and nomenclature and branding around that so that it feels like it was built, which it is for the Catholic community. Wow. That's so good. Mills, you got thoughts on the, on the, on the, on the Catholic community? I, I, I love it. I I think there's so much. uh, And I love that question of, of how, what can we learn from? Um, I, I think, you know, and I, Pete Scazzaro is a mentor of mine and so much of what he has taught me about kind of monastic practices, uh, mm-hmm. I'm so intrigued by, uh, and, and have grown, uh, so much in. And yeah. I think, um, I, and I do, I love, uh, Molly, even as you say, of like, we're all about the capital C church. And, um, yep. and, and so I think as we, we all collectively learn and grow together, uh, and, and I think lean in uh, to our differences and distinctives uh, that, that are beautiful um, and make kind of the collective capital C church awesome. Um, and uh, anyway, so I, I love that, totally. excited about that. Molly, one of the things that caught my attention, uh, well, it uh, definitely caught my attention because we have kids that are the exact same age. Um, and mm-hmm. so I've got a 10 year old and a 12 year old that's about, so I'm about to have a 13 year old. So I'm about to have the teenager in my house. Um, you are- Thank you. <laughs> uh, it is it is a special time, uh, but but obviously a, a com- complicated time. time. Um, you are though a CEO of a large company with over uh, you know h- hundreds of employees. Uh, that's that's you know the weight on you uh, is is massive uh, from what churches are expecting of you, what your employees are expecting of you, and at the end of the day, what your family is is expecting of you. Um, we, we are in a season and, and, and I've experienced it very closely in my home church, uh, of burnout, um, and, and, and seeing mm-hmm. so many ministry leaders burning out. Um, I would love to know, is, is there anything, how do you take care of yourself as a leader, um, yeah. and, and maybe even prevent burnout or health in your, the organization that you lead? Um, and what advice maybe would you have for others, uh, as we're coming in to this new kind of post COVID world and season that, uh, that that seems to have such a trend towards uh, burnout among among ministry leaders. Yeah, I I have such a huge heart for ministry leaders. It has been such an intense, crazy couple of years, and you know I think that it's the change fatigue, right? And I'm a change junkie, just to be really forthcoming. Like I love change; it excites me. I've always seen great opportunity come out of seasons of change for people in my life and for myself. But there is something that is exhausting about the constant change that we've been in, I think, specific to business leaders, but really church leaders, right? 
are we meeting in person this week? Do I have to record online this week? How many services are we going to have? Okay. Nobody wants to do zoom anymore. Great. How do you know, it's like this constant back and forth and ebb and flow. And I think the people who are smart have said out loud, I need a break. I need before I burn out, I need to, I need to step back and I need to refresh myself. Right. Uh, Pastor Greg Rochelle, who has the amazing leadership podcast. He spoke about this, I think in, in March and April on his podcast. And, you know, I think that I'd encourage people to listen to that because the other thing I just appreciate about him and is something we were talking about before about Pastor Judy at Shoreline City Church, yeah. who is so authentic. She leads us herself. Hmm. And I think the thing I appreciated about what Pastor Craig said on his podcast was he was just honest. He said, it's been hard and nobody wants to say it out loud. And so I think for myself, I found like such a connection point to hearing him say that and to step back and say, it has been hard. And if my team's listening, they know like I, I push hard, like I, I demand excellence in our organization and I don't apologize for that, but I also need to acknowledge when people need a break. Yep. So what we've tried to do at push pay is see it first. Don't let it happen. See it coming. And we've given a ton of people, not all at the same time, but step away. Do you yeah. need a couple weeks in a row? Do you need three weeks? Do you need a month? Like step away so that you can come back refreshed. Yep. And, you know, the the gentleman I was just sharing with you about who shared that article over with me this morning, last summer, he took a three weeks off and, and came back. He's still here. He's, yeah. you know, leads a great team in our organization. He leads up to me, right? He sends me articles that he thinks mm -hmm. I might like or resonate with. I love that. Yeah. That behavior comes from people who are refreshed. Yes. They're bought in and they want to be here. And so I think, you know, for myself, I love nature. I have to get outside, right? You even see if people are watching on yep. YouTube, you know, I need to see the outside. Like mm -hmm. I, I love to get out. I love to, my oldest daughter plays softball. I love to be on the sidelines, you know, feet in the grass, watching that. I love to hike in the winter. I ski and try to prioritize that on Saturdays with my family. Like just the fresh air getting outside is so refreshing for yeah. me. The other thing that I prioritize that I, I think, I, I think that the, um, the faith community has actually done this better maybe than the business space, but is prioritizing mentorship. Oh, I do yeah. not know all of the things. I will never know all of the things, but I have to build a network of people that I trust that when I am in need of information or just a good word that I can phone or text them and they pick up and they breathe life back into me. And I then have to be committed to doing that to another generation of leaders. And so that's something I think that has helped me to stay focused and balanced and, you know, hear that you're not the only one kind of walking through a hard season. Molly, that's so good. That that last one particularly, uh, I'm actually glad you said that. You could have stopped right before that and it would have been gold. Uh, I think we got a whole nother level there. I do think mentorship is the, rest is the easy one. Uh, yet we really fail at that all the time, especially as leaders giving our um, uh, people that we oversee that rest uh, and even giving ourselves as high capacity leaders the permission to rest. That And yet that's the easy one. I think the one that goes overlooked is who's in your phone that you can call and it's not, it's more than, um, it's more than your best friend. It's not venting. That's not what you're talking about. You're talking about no. the person that's ahead of you down the road, uh, that you can call to remind you, oh yeah, I remember going through that season, looking at both of you with a 10 and 13 year old, I have a five and a three year old, right? So I'm like, okay, Nils and Molly write your guys' books so that I can read them when I get down there. <laughs> but it, it's having people who have walked it or yes. are walking in it a little bit yes. further down that can give perspective, that can give, uh, all of those healthy things that you need when you're not in a season of good perspective, uh, yep. because you might be tired in addition to having, uh, feeling overwhelmed and just, um, that leads to distortion, uh, yep. and that can lead to bad decisions as well. Um, not just personally, but like, oh, I need to leave. And it's like, no, you don't, you just need to make this tiny little pivot. Cause I remember when I walked through there. Sure. Um, and so that is really, really, really good advice that we all need. We need to have those people and then, and then taking it a step further, 
who are you pouring back into behind you? And that is the Christian walk. Uh, yes. And I do think that the, we have a great opportunity uh, as followers of Jesus to emulate how Jesus did that so well. Uh, and so I'm just so glad that you said that, Molly. That's. Do you have anything else that you want to add on that? Yeah. The, the thing I, I guess I would add to that is I feel like you need that in all areas of your life, right? I want to have people yes. in my marriage that have are 10 years older than we are, 20, 30, 40, 50. How in the world did you get to your 50th wedding anniversary, right? right. I want to know what did you do, you know, or when things get really intense. I, I remember a vivid conversation I had with someone, my husband and I were super blessed. And when we were uh, very newly married, I think we'd been married for just a few years, we joined a small group through our church. And it was married couples of all different age ranges. We always would joke, we think we kind of got put in the wrong one, but they just didn't notice, you know, because we were like so young, but they knew what they were doing. And I remember this woman telling me a story about walking through alcoholism with her husband like 20 years earlier wow! and how she stuck with him through that battle. And it was ugly and they had young kids and it was so hard, but I would have never known that, right? They had such a unbelievably fruitful, rich marriage with adult kids. And so I just, I will forever remember that of, wow, if Heather could stick through yeah. That season to see the fruit on the other side, I'm pretty sure I can get over the laundry or the dishes not being done, you know, like <laughs> right. not to take away from the big things, but sometimes yeah. we make the small things, the big things totally. or in parenting, right? Goodness gracious, it can get really intense. So it's great to have that or in business, you know, I, um, this is my very first CEO gig. I know that like, I, I'm not shy to say it. And so I have people who have been a 10, 20, 30 year CEO veteran in my life that I have on speed dial. When I'm driving home at seven o'clock at night, stressed and not sure what to do, I can call and they pick up and they're like, "Ooh, I remember that. Mm -hmm. You know, so I I think people sometimes want to think one person can be their mentor for all the things. And I think that's really tricky. Maybe, maybe, but I think it's okay to have different people that you phone in different seasons and situations. That's awesome, Molly. Yeah. Thank you so much for being uh, an excellent example of a CEO. Thank you for being a female who is doing that. Thank you for being a mom. Uh, and thank you for sharing so much uh, time and life experience with us here on the podcast. Uh, since this is a social media church podcast, and I think uh, for people in the social media space, you especially uh, need to have these mentors because perspective can get distorted the fastest Mm, in a digital social media space. Um, I am curious, are either of your 13 or 10 year old on social media? Great question. That's the first question. Great question. This has been a battle in our house. I don't know about for others. Um, And I actually, so there's a great, great guy, uh, Larry Hubodka. I think Nils, you probably know Larry. He was at Elevation Church for a really long time in their communication role. He now is like a principal running a consulting firm, but his, his daughters are like 10 years older than my girls. You're maybe not that, but you know, they're a whole different yeah. season. And so I just kind of watch intently what he does with his kids, you know? And so we, um, have allowed our, our 13 year old has Snapchat. Okay. Um, I, I hope she's not listening. We also have her Snapchat account so we can okay. see the interactions. Sure. Um, and she knows that, but I think she forgets, which is great. And so we can kind of monitor and watch that. But you know, the the reality, and my 10 year old's just really not interested. Like she's a artist, nature lover. She kind of doesn't care and we're, we're super okay with yep. that as well. Um, but you know, we want them to learn how to be responsible and protect totally. themselves in our home. You know, I don't want that to happen on the yep. side or in a sneaky way, mm-hmm. you know, where we don't have the opportunity to have a healthy conversation. So that's our family's approach. I I have a lot of respect that there are different ways to go about that. I can't tell you the number of times I've said, man, maybe we should move to an island and just have an ice cream hut and burn (laughs) all of the phones. I have said that. But this is is the reality that our our youth are growing up in. So we want to help to be great stewards of that tech. I, I love that. If I, um, and what, and we're navigating the same thing and it, it is one of the curses of knowing too much too in technology of all the yes. things that they can get into, but it's also, 
uh, I always push. And I think, I think it's a role of youth pastors to educate parents around social media mm-hmm. and how their kids are, are with the platforms they're on and, and how they could be monitoring them effectively because a 13 year old does not need independent access uh, to the internet. Yeah. Um, no good decisions I think can be made uh, at that age with that access. Um, yeah, I, I agree. I, so we, we are going to leave notes in, in at socialmedia.church to yep. the research study, to push pay, to all the things. Yep. Um, but Molly, as we wrap up uh, this, well, actually, before we wrap up, I got to say to, I was thinking about Larry, who I haven't seen Larry in many years, but from a mentoring standpoint, if he could teach me how to stop aging, he has, he has know, figured right? that out. He Honestly. looks like he's like 25 years old still, and he's got like a kid that, it's 20. Uh, so I, I, agree. I would love some mentoring in that area. I, from I, I joke yeah. all the time. I'm like, can I get a blood transfusion? Will yeah. that help me? You know, what, what am I doing wrong? Yes. He, he is an exceptional human being. So whoever is getting to be mentored by Larry, uh, is, is a, is a lucky, uh, individual, uh, boy, that takes me back to, to some of those conferences, um, and the wisdom that, that has been shared. Uh, but Molly, as, as you, as we wrap up uh, this episode, any final thoughts that you would love to share about anything, uh, technology related, leadership related, communications related uh, with church leaders uh, here as we wrap and up? And really quickly, I also want to know what your favorite social media uh, platform is as well. I was curious about your kids, but also yours. So okay. yeah, final yeah, thoughts as I, well as your favorite social media. Yeah, I'm an Instagram person. Yeah. I, okay. I really, really love Instagram. I love that it's image based. I love that for the most part, it's not quite as um, politically charged as some of the other yep. platforms. It's true. And, you know, I think there's a lot of stress in our life. So for me, I choose things that bring me joy. And I've actually kind of turned off some of the other platforms in my life because I didn't feel like they were actually bringing joy. Um, so I, I would say Instagram. Um, you know, I think the thing that I would just leave with is, Number one, church leaders have such a difficult job, and I am just in awe of how they wake up and fight for community every single day. I have been so blessed in my career to get to know so many of those leaders, and I I know even though you know our media wants to kind of really um, point to the worst, I see the best. I see those church leaders just charging hard and fighting to make a big difference in the world. So just to the folks listening, I'm so grateful that you are creating the future for my kids. And um, I think that's a a really special thing. I think from a technology and leadership standpoint, you know, I, I am talking about this the way I think about it and leading push pay and how we make decisions, right? When I'm, when I'm talking about this, I'm not pitching something, but we, we go through a process. We hold each other accountable to making investments in things that are going to help us grow. And so I think if there's anything I can leave with, it's really make sure that when you're thinking about changing or keeping or evolving when it comes to technology, that you're thinking about it as an investment in the future of your community and your ministry. That's so good. Molly, thank you so much for your time. This has been an absolute pleasure for Nils and I to interview you. And I know that on the other side of this is going to bless so many people who are listening. If you are listening to this episode, uh, I know that there's a pastor that you're thinking of that maybe is not listening to this, uh, that needs to hear it, whether it's about data security, whether it's about uh, tech stacks, whether it's about uh, just good mentorship. Uh, Send this podcast along. We would really appreciate that. The other thing we would appreciate is if you subscribe to this podcast, uh, you can also write a review wherever you're listening to this podcast. And that helps us connect with other people who are in the ministry space, who maybe are trying to navigate this next generation and this next iteration of technology in the space and who need to meet Molly, frankly, uh, and hear some of the things that she's shared. So uh, thank you so much, Molly, for being on. Uh, And to all who are listening, we will talk to you again on the next episode.